the retrogrades for the second night in a row, I make a late PM show rather than early PM or, or late AM. That's on account of a couple things. Firstly, I, I wanted to, because the, the topic of this show is the lost Eugenio Scalfari, Pope Francis interviews, I wanted to s double check and triple check the things I was about to say, because it's, it's an important show. And I did that. So I have a, a, a high quality revision of the Francis Scalfari interviews, the overlooked, deliberately memory hold interviews of Francis and Eugenio Scalfari, La Repubblica's editor founder. Very, very, very interesting and problematic and dismissed as bogus interviews um, by Pope Swainers. And I'm, I'm gonna get into that in tonight's show. But I wanted to be thorough. Thoroughness is, is part of what we do here. And it's first and foremost, because I'm usually coming to you live with at, maybe not news, but at least a perspective that's rather unique to myself. And I did that. Double and triple checking matters. The second reason I came to you later than normal is because today, as you all know, there is big news coming out of Church Militant, so I ended up spending what portion of the day that I wasn't able to commit to researching the Scalfrey inter interviews with Francis. I had to be on the phone with, with uh, lots and lots of different friends and sources close to Church Militant, close to Michael Boris, who has, I'm going to address this right now, resigned as um, chief boss of Church Militant. And he was basically forced out. And I'm glad that I waited till this very hour, 620 CST, to do so because just a little bit before I went live, Michael released uh, a statement, 15-minute statement, I found it very helpful. A lot of times statements are more often than not sort of femme speak where it's, it's a whole bunch of canned, pre-written, pre-arranged sentimentality that oftentimes even contradicts itself um, and, and doesn't end up saying anything and takes up 15 minutes of your time all in the name of emotional sincerity. That's the funny part. People will be like, look, I'm going to be emotionally sincere with you. I'm going to tell you everything. Um, and, then, and then they don't. And then they're just covering their ribs the whole time. And it's covered in platitudes, covered in uh, um, sentimentality, covered in you know, expressing statements like, I'm humbled by this great trophy you're giving me, but which doesn't make any sense. Things like that. Oddities from strange English language bastardized Roman Catholic morals watered down year of our Lord 2023. This is not at all what Michael Voris's message was, 15 minutes. He delivered it in a tweet. It was one of the most sincere, most emotionally authentic things I've ever seen delivered over Catholic airwaves. I was... Sincerely impressed. I noted, I've always noted, it's one of these Salingerian truisms of real life that when things like this happen, the, the, the petty bastards out there are going to be petty and triumphalistic and, and cheer at the demise of a man that they long viewed as their enemy. And you've seen that in the right, center, and the left. That's pretty obvious. Where it gets really Salingerian is in folks that suppose they're being magnanimous. So there are some other folks in Catholic media that, that said more or less the same things I'm going to say here, but it's always hedged with and usually um, prefaced with, here's my relation, my rapport, my uh, relative position vis-a-vis Michael Voris and Church Milton over the last five years. We didn't always get along, or they, they, he criticized me, or blah. We don't have to say any of that. It's not necessary. It doesn't hurt 
when it's in context. But why not just either defend someone or attack someone? Simpliciter, that's what I say. So that's why I, I like to lead with the obvious thing. Wow. Voris, Michael's message was impressively sincere. And he said, I mean, 99.5% of just all the right things where I was like, this is someone that's not bastardizing language. I mean, everything you would want to be there was there. Said, look, the consequences of these demons of mine are real and public. The demons themselves are private, but most people care about the consequences. So I'm going to apologize to them. I'm going to apologize to you, my viewing audience. And I'm going to apologize to the people at Church Militant who are kind of left holding the bag. I know I left him holding the bag. That's perfect. That's perfect to intone that. But then what he said that was even perfecter is he said, look, I founded St. Michael's Media, Church Militant, uh, whatever, decades ago in order to bring souls to heaven. And just because I'm this fallen messenger, please don't fault the message. And by the message, he really meant just keep on your path. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, be with us on the way. <laughs> Yeah, and then there's this little plug for keep giving your support to Church Militant. I think I think Mike understands that that and as a secondary measure, people will be at least maybe they'll continue doing that. That's fine. They'll be more hesitant to do that than to not fly off the bark of Peter, which was his main plea and utterly sincere. And this is what I like about Michael Voris, and and you guys all like about Michael Voris. And I, I have called the man a friend for the better part of a decade. Um, he, you know, he, here's where people lead up front with the relationality. Haven't talked to him so much over the last two years. I think one, one message over the last 20 months or something like that, back and forth. And it was friendly. I, I think, um, I think Mike felt the need, totally unrelated to any, anything he's going through right now. I think he felt the need to sort of back off, you know, after, after, you know, the, the, um, the book debacle between uh, my brother and I, and really, really, really between my brother and Sophia Institute Press, uh, which which he chose to take out on everyone but Sophia Institute Press. Um, and, and them at times. So I think that that's why I haven't, there was never any personal falling out between um, Mike and me. But then, you know, people people all usually, when when someone goes through personal scandal, Folks that were fair weather friends want the distance, even if they didn't have the distance, even if they talked to the guy last night. I'm See, I'm kind of, uh, that's kind of not how I'm put together. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of rush toward the fire. I don't hedge much. So, I, you know, I, I wish we'd been talking over the last two years because I'm not, I'm not self-protect. I don't tend to toward self-protection that way. Um, so I'm kind of the opposite. A lot of close people are like, oh, I better disown, disown, disown even though they might have talked to their scan newly scandal-ridden friend. I'm talking in general now. Last night or the night before, I, I'm kind of the opposite. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but I do consider him a friend still. I never stopped considering him a friend. I, I, I didn't know that this was going on, and I, I've talked to people all day on the phone. But I will just say this. Whether you do or don't choose to continue patronage of um, St. Michael's Media, Church Militant, um, he, man, Voris hit it right on the head. I could tell you in just one thing, this is where rapport and personal firsthand accounts, relationality, etc., do matter. The guy is a sincere lover of Jesus and he's, he's got a big heart, which other people, I think Matt Frad said this, I've said it before. Who else has said it? No one else. You don't see that on screen when he's doing the you know, Vortex yelling at the screen. The guy's got a very big heart. And and um, yeah, he, he bleeds too. And yeah, he airs too. And the, I'm, not, I'm not trying to render de minimis the ways that he, he sounds like he aired here. And again, I don't really pull punches. I, I, I think, I think I, I think we all know what we're thinking. It's a big time goof, more than that. And he's, he's suffering the consequences now, but he's absolutely right. What, you know, 
the book of Psalms says the Lord ponders the heart. And somehow in his divine justice, there's a way of pondering the heart. His son, the fighter, Michael Voris, who really he starts tearing up at a moment in his 15-minute message. Those are not croc tears. I, I'm, I'm big into physiognomy. I can always tell. Um, it, he's, he's, I think Mike's going to work it out and, and, um, and turn, turn whatever this stuff is that he's talking that's plagued him for 62 years around because he sincerely loves Jesus. I, I will vouch for him on that much. Just pray for him. And not that passive aggressive, bitchy Catholic will pray for this guy because he's probably going. Pray for him. Pray for him. We've all got sincere issues. Now some are some are bigger than others. Right? I mean, three and a half years ago, Abby went to the hospital and had to have the le- uh, what left half of her brain basically diswired. And it was like other people are like relating to me and saying, oh, my, my, you know, my, my kid had a bad flu and had to go get checked into the hospital a couple years back. And, I, you know, one thing's bigger than another. That doesn't mean that in proportion they can't relate to me. Um, midwits will always say, oh, well, that's a brain surgery. You, how dare you compare your situation to mine? No, I'm trying to be em- empathetic. That's what you guys should do. When we say, like, look, we all have bad flaws. We've all mortal sinned. That's not to say that they're all the same mortal sin, but, but they aren't the same mortal sin, but mortal is mortal. Pray for a brother on the way and say, and then I know people, I know you guys, I know how people are going to, I know the conversational patterns, which create these sinusoids of favorable and disfavorable content in my com boxes. You create these sinusoids up and down. You're going to say, well, what about Michael Lofton? Didn't you just do a mean video? Yeah, I look. Michael Lofton too. All of us. Heaven help us. That's that's what we need. Pope Francis too, right? I'm more angry at him than any of these guys. He screwed us over more than any of these guys. And, and him too. All of us need the sacraments. I, I'm trying not to be cheap here. But just please, yeah, please, just pray for all these guys. My, myself, pray for my family. Pray, uh, I'll pray for your families. Um, pray for Voris. Pray for, pray for Christine Niles, who's a single mom, you know, or who needed that single wage job. Now her parting ways from Church Militant makes a little more sense. Pray for all the people at Church Militant. They've done good work in the past. Win, lose, or draw from this point into the future. They've done good work in the past. Did you have anything you wanted to say, Steph? No, I just wanted to back what up what you just said and say, as Catholics, one of the things we should love most about our faith is the ability to go to confession. What I saw today in Michael Voris's uh, video really was, in, in a way, is a public confession. And anybody yeah. like spiking the ball in the end zone on his personal failings, you know, it, it's it's really disgusting. We should be upholding and honoring the beauty of confession, how we can be redeemed through our faults. And if the man really truly is acknowledging his faults honestly and truly seeking to reconcile him with Christ, everyone needs to be rejoicing in that and praying for the man's soul. I agree for my part, but now I don't want to get into female virtue signaling. Women are, you know, that's, a, that's a, I think, a, a beautiful expression of a, a female perspective but the reality of life is one does have enemies yeah. a man that takes stands has enemies and the the enemies out there that that boris has they're not they're not all self-same enemies of mine but we had a lot of the same so you know hey he spoke harsh against them they're gonna this this is also a moment you know it, what a lawyer learns to do in the courtroom is okay this is a definite loss they're gonna my enemies are gonna be spiking the football it's really cool if one or two of them are like have a little change of heart and they think, maybe I shouldn't spike the football in the end zone now that Boris is down. Um, but most of them will. And, and he knows that. He's a man. I'm a man. Um, Steph expressed, intoned the woman's perspective. And it's, it's not wrong. It's just, you know, um, c'est la vie. This is, this is how, you know, I, I, I consider myself still a friend of, of Boris and have reached out individually. And you do, too. And, you know, he's, he was really, he's a nice man. 
He was really kind to us when Tim lost his job. I'll never forget. He called us up the day it happened to lend any assistance he could help. He know that Abby just had brain surgery. Yeah. Um, I, I will forever be thankful to him for that. Yeah. And I will be praying for him ardently. The two people I think that called first, I think I was still doing an interview with that uh, Black MAGA guy. The two people that called me first before I was even off the thing, they called and talked to Steph, <laughs> besides our personal personal friends like um, Scott and, and G, were, yeah. were, uh, were Pat Coffin and Michael Boris. And it's like, we're all at each other's throats. And I'm not saying, say, unite the clans or sing Kumbaya or let's unite around this. No, I mean, this is a horrible thing. I'm just saying, look, it's even even bad things when you have someone that's willing to be awake and say I I need to go to confession and beat this. Good, that's the best thing. Maybe that's you know maybe that's what was neat. I mean, more than anything, it's just a personal testimony. I mean, he's he is a nice man. That's fine for he has enemies, but don't expect all of his friends to leave his side or anything like that. That's exactly what I was going to say. I think a lot of people, we won't. they start in with, aren't you friends with this person? Like, yes. Yeah. I'm a friend to this man, even beyond his faults. But let us all acknowledge that he needs to get over these faults and right. rectify himself to Christ. A right. true friend brings you back to Christ and encourages you when you know that you fall away from Christ and say, no, get back on the shining path. Right. Get your soul back on the shining path. True friends do not leave you to the wolves and your own devices when you're struggling. Now, we haven't spoken to Boris in quite some time, but we'd be happy to take that call and, and give him the encouragement that he needs to get back in with Christ if he hasn't already done so. Yeah, sounds like he's, his head's in the right place yeah. on this. But it's really important that you don't kick dogs when they're down. And it's last, last PSA, because again, I was just talking to Anthony from Avoiding Babylon about this <laughs> this afternoon. He's one of the many people I spoke to. Um. What did you, you love? One of the few points I really added to our dumper show was um, a king well tends his borders. Yes. So I know where my sovereignty ends. Look, I'm not telling anyone out there that's an, an enemy of Boris that you can't spike the football, but not you might Catholic. spike the football now. Wait, well, I don't even say the not Catholic thing. <laughs> no, not, Cap I, I said oh, not classy. Yeah, not classy. I, you can spike the football, but realize your, your faults probably aren't going to be as public or as embarrassing as this one, but they're there. And um, he might've fallen from grace today. Doesn't mean he's down for good. Uh, there, but for the grace of God, go you with, with a different fault. And so that's the humbling thought that might entice you to think, huh? And again, yes, even with regard to Michael Lofton, who recently worked with Church Middleton. I think that's a mistake for them to work with him. But yes, even with regard to a guy like that, that it goes around attacking everyone. Um, we're all in this together. Okay, so having said that, <laughs> now, and this I do apply this to Pope Francis, but not all of us, not myself, not Michael Lofton, not Michael Voris, not, uh, I don't know, Kennedy Hall, Taylor Marshall, Tim Flander. Just take, take your pick. All of us leading our private lives, like, you know, trying to, trying to be close to the source. But we're all leading these private lives like coals thrown from the fire, as Wit says in Thin Red Line. Trying to be close to the fire, you know? Um not all of us have this massive constellation apparatus of, of media mouthpieces to cover up for us as we're trying to do evil. That's different. Now, Pope Francis does have that. And that's the, the, the purpose of today's show. So, by my count, this is a very hard count to say, Pope Francis made 11, 11 interviews with his friend, founder, head editor of La Repubblica, Marxist, atheist, socialist, Italian newspaper, circulated there in Rome. They used to hand them to me on the, the metro. 
He did 11 interviews by my count, and Francis considered him one of, one of his very, very close friends. And here's the thing. You have been propagandized about whether or not Francis's answers to Eugenio Scalfari were actually misrepresented by Scalfari, misrepresented by the media after Scalfari characterized what Francis said. And this is because of one key element. The old style of European journalism, parachorphans and retrogrades, considered valid widely till toward the end of the 20th century, a valid form of journalism, was for the uh, journo to sit there with the person he's interviewing, have a talk, Without a recording device, which didn't exist, you know, for until until relatively recently in human history, and without even taking notes, that's the strange part. Without even taking shorthand, considered a valid form of the old school European interview. Scalfari used this form. He used it for all eleven interviews with Pope Francis. Pope Francis said things according to. The usual, the norm, as observed by Scalfari, the journalist, he said, according to Scalfari, that there is no hell. He said that four times in four of the interviews. There is no hell. Souls just evaporate upon death if they're unfaithful. And he said that, more importantly, that Jesus was not God while he was man, according to Scalfari. Now, before we get into, did Pope Francis and the Vatican deny that he said this? A preliminary note. Then we'll get into it. Preliminary note one. Here's what Francis said upon Scalfari's death. Well, actually, this is Matteo Bruni, the Holy See Press Office uh, Secretary. This is in 2022 that he died. Vatican said Pope Francis had learned with sorrow of the passing of his friend. So as at the end of his life, they were friends. They never fell out from everything I could dig and find. They never fell out over any mischaracterizations, which would be deep, deep slander. In America, we have a specific tort for the kind of Calumny, printed calumny, that disables one from doing their job. If you imply a bus driver has seizures, this is the number one thing, he can't do his job. If you imply a banker has sticky fingers and steals from the cash drawer. If you imply a a, a pilot likes to drink before flying or has bad vision even without drinking, something like that. It's a particular tort in the common law tradition. They, they never had any falling out over it. Here's what Francis said, according to Bruni, which is a little more specific upon the death of Eugenio Scalfari. He cherishes, Pope Francis does, with affection, the memory, not of the man only, but the meetings, the memory of those meetings. And the deep conversations on the ultimate questions of humankind. He cherishes those 11 conversations that he had with him over the years, and he entrusts his soul to the Lord in prayer, so he thinks he's in heaven, once again, even though he's he's an atheist, so that he may receive him and console those who are close to him. So they never had, from any digging I did, any falling out over any of the alleged purported mischaracterizations that Scalfari made of Francis' own words, I don't think they're mischaracterizations, by the way. Never had any falling out. And more than that, Francis cherishes those conversations. So here's preliminary note to Bene too. Imagine you're you're any one of these jobs applying for a position, or let's say you're a new new holder of the the office I mentioned. Let's say it's, we don't use bus driver, let's say banker, a little higher in the socioeconomic strata. You give an interview to your local paper 
about some unrelated topic. And you are a well-known banker in town. You hold a position of esteem. And the journalist does the old European style of journalism. So he reconstructs from his memory what you said, sitting face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart, mind to mind. And he says that you yourself claimed, well, I'm this new banker, but I have sticky fingers. I can't do the job. Uh, you know, it, essentially, I can't do the job. I, I've stolen from lots of my past jobs and I'm, you know, this has some bearing on my ability to do the job again. Imagine you said something like that. That's interview number one or two. Let's say you do 11 more interviews with him or 10 more interviews with him or nine more interviews with him. I'm going to go through each of the dates of each of these interviews between Francis and Scalfari. Your friends and family would say, are you nuts? Let's say further beyond that. You do more interviews with someone that, that made up, that fabricated something that should ruin your life and your career. And in Francis's case, destroy the faith of millions. Let's say not only do you do 9, 10, 11 more interviews with this person, but you call him friend, you never have a fallout, and you never specifically deny the charge of having that I, I told him I had sticky fingers and I'd stolen from past employers. Let's say you say, look, I, you know, he, he didn't get the exact words right. All he did, that reporter, is he reconstructed, not perfectly accurately from his memory, what he thought he heard. That's not a repudiation. That's all the Vatican press office did after any of these any of these interviews. Finally, final preliminary note. Let's say that I continue to hold that banker position, a position of esteem in the town, let's say it's somewhat public, and then the elderly journo dies. And I say, um, with sorrow, I lament the passing of my friend, and I cherish, you, go, you make a public statement, I'm the banker, the journo's dead. I cherish with affection the memory of those conversations, that conversation that we had. I love it. I've never repudiated what he said I said, that I had sticky fingers and that could ruin my ability to do my job accurately. It's the essential property of doing my job well. We had these deep conversations on the ultimate questions of humankind. And then, of course, subject matter jurisdiction you say, I entrust his uh, soul to the Lord in prayer. This is, Fran I can't even imagine what the equivalent in my an analogate would be. But you say, I entrust his soul to the Lord in prayer. This goes to that, uh, is there really a hell question? So Francis is thumbing his nose at us extra by saying that. Francis likes to do this stuff, people. So that's the preliminary, that's the preliminary uh, notion. Quickly, you need to get out of your blue state and get to a red state. Go to realestateforlife.org and you will talk to someone who's pro-life and a Catholic, likely, who will help you get out of your blue state and get to a red state before the election, before the next beer bug, even if it's not at all viral. Might be aliens. Whatever the next huge scam is, top down, you want to be in a red state before it happens. Bad things happen to people in blue states, urban areas, when bad things happen. Go to realestateforlife.org. I go from the bluest to the blue, like I did, to the reddest of the red. Realestateforlife.org. Move today. It's a reality. Easier to move in the winter than the summer. If you want to support this channel, please like this video. More important than that, please click on the subscribe button. I, I wanted to hit 50,000 subscribers before the end of the year. Finally, support this channel. Go to Subscribestar or Locals. We have a group for our Subscribestar and Locals 
who are reading Lord of the Rings. Currently, we're going all the way through all six books in all three novels. Each novel has two books. Fellowship, Two Towers, Return of the King. We're still not that far into Fellowship. You can catch up. Become a Locals and Subscribe Star supporter today. I actually really need your support. Okay, now. I Speaking of apologias and apologies, two opposite things, good work done by flawed men. That's, that's, that's all of us. Um, good work done by men who might have fallen from a, a position of esteem or authority. The, um, my friend, oh, and again, I still consider this, this guy a friend too. I, I didn't know him as well as I knew Voris back in the day or ever, but, but Steve Skojic, the founder and the editor, not of Republica, but of another media company, One Peter Five. I really liked that, that weblog when Steve ran it. And it really helped me. I, I cite from 1 Peter 5 articles many, many times, even now, and there are articles from 14, 15, 16, 17, in the early to middle years of the Francis Pontificate, there was no site as good as 1 Peter 5. Even LifeSite wasn't as good as 1 Peter 5 on the Francis Pontificate. So I want to talk about, um, well, on these claims, in March of 2018, Scalfari claims that Francis told him hell doesn't exist, the disappearance of souls of sinners um, does exist. And, and he would repeat this several times. He'd repeat this several times, four times by Skojic's count. Well, there's a to-do. There's an imbroglio that needs to be hashed out. And Skojic is a guy that sometimes issues stuff that I think is quite compelling. It's con conspiracy theory, which is unfortunate because a lot of people sometimes issue what I'm saying and what Sko I'm going to read from Skojex um, in vain on this matter at 1 Peter 5 in a October 2019 article. His position is self-same with mine. His article is in it's from October the 11th, 2019. The article title is, The evidence suggests the Francis Scalfari connection is no accident. It's worth reading almost the entire thing. And I think that's what I'm going to do on air because he has dates and names. And I was organizing this whiteboard the way I always do for these shows. I'm old school like that, but but Steve did the work for me. And I don't think I read this one in 2019. I might not have been reading 1 Peter 5 as much in 2019. If I read it at the time, I've forgotten it. Since the news broke early this week that the nonagenarian, that means 90-year-old, atheist socialist editor of Italy's La Repubblica, Eugenio Scalfari, claimed that Pope Francis, this is October 2019, told him during one of their many conversations that he did not believe Jesus was God, the Catholic commentariat has been engaged in a rhetorical battle to the death over who to believe, whether it's true, what it all means. And I don't think it was much of a battle. I think it was guys like Steve, when me cheering for him, I guess this happened when I was on TNT. It was like a week before my last show on TNT. Now that I'm looking at the date. So I must have missed it. Uh, I think most people were one-sided. There was less Pope splaining happening in 2019 than now. Largely because of, uh, you know, a few, a few voices. Mine was one of them that were really popular at the time. Criticizing Francis. Pope splaining was in its natter point or whatever. Reverse zenith. It's really gained ground, and it really gained ground in COVID. That's a weird thing, because Francis has only got linearly worse, but the Pope Splainers who were beaten back, I thought once and for all, in 2018, 2019, 2020, after McCarrick, this goon, villain, proven to be Francis's kingmaker and the beneficiary of Francis's skullduggery, covering for him. I thought that was done. Francis has come back, but... 
In 2019, there was a kind of univocal pressure, even on right-wing Catholic media, to say, now, the Vatican, um, each of these times, has dismissed what Scalfari says. Why does he keep doing interviews? Steve Skojic asks. Why does he keep doing interviews? Me and Taylor Marshall at the time were asking. With a guy that keeps misrepresenting him? Why three years later when Scalfari died, did Francis say, oh man, I love those talks we had. Would you say that if you'd been slandered? Okay, you get the point. Steve continues, for those willing to look objectively at the matter, it becomes clear that the confusion is the result of an intentional strategy on the part of the Pope and his communications team. Bellissimo. Inasmuch as deception is a key component of this strategy, they will never admit it, but it is my hope to demonstrate here that it is the only reasonable explanation. And I think Steve Skojek does an admirable job uh, closing the circle on this explanation. I think the only interpretation that stands, to borrow Bergolian language, Francis's language, of... Why would he keep giving all these interviews and saying he loves his friend and he loved doing the interviews? Oh, and by the way, we're going to get to the exact verbiage of the Vatican. They never, ever denied it explicitly, what he'd said. Why would he keep going back? Steve, Steve is right. So this first bolded section is called, Who Do You Trust? Francis is a politician first. Uh, whatever his name is. Javier Millet said that to Tucker Carlson in that interview that I played some of yesterday. And guess what? Guess what? This is right. He's a Peronist. Peron, who, who gave Francis lots of pointers indirectly on how to lead an outfit, said, always go, if you're pushing left, do some unexpected right wing thing in the middle of it. If you're leaning right and you want to push the church right, do some unexpected leftist thing. Keep the people guessing. That is the heart of Machiavellian Peronism. Say it with me now. Machiavellian Peronism from Argentina. Okay? So, this is very important. Francis confuses with counter-signaling he, and Francis isn't like Perón. Perón wasn't really a leftist or a rightist. Francis is a man of the left. But what he did pick up from Perón is always counter-signal when you're pushing hard one way or the other with some opposite messaging. Who do you trust, Steve Skojic writes. I'd like to begin my addressing by addressing a question I've seen asked many times of in different words. Why should we believe a 95-year-old atheist socialist who doesn't even take notes instead of the Pope? That's what all the Pope's planners will say. And they'll get snarky with you. You're a Catholic. Why not believe this guy instead of the Pope? This is like in the JFK... Um, uh, what was it? Well, the Warren Commission. Remember they kept saying, why believe the words of a couple of uh, showgirls and even a hooker and a junk fiend over the Vice President of the United States who they're kind of indicting, LBJ? Or, you know, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, Earl Warren. Well, sometimes lowly people tell the truth. It's different with the junkie or maybe a, a, a hooker if she's trying to get money to extort a higher person. There's a, a, a clear interest there to lie. But with Eugenio Scalfari... Steve Skojic will point out he is absolutely not interested. He doesn't have an interest in, a vested monetary interest in lying about Francis. And also, he's got all of the indicia of telling the truth. Here's an actual quote from a Pope Splainer. He didn't say it and denied it. And the guy who made the allegation is a 90-year-old atheist who takes no notes. Here's another Pope Splainer. Skojic writes, I, I added Pope Splainer. Here's another. I'm no fan of Pope Francis, but I do have to wonder 
If an atheist with an axe to grind against the church, they love that expression, is the best witness to anything the Pope says, this just seems too convenient, if you know what I mean. One variant, this time from Catholic Answer staff apologist Trent Horn, uh, and then the, the, the tweet is gone or something. I don't see it there. But, but Skojic says, the sentiment, this sentiment is understandable and demands an answer. So it must have been a, a more reasonable one than the first one. But here's the Scalfari strategy, according to Skojic. And I'm going to read all the specifics to you in due time. The first time Pope Francis caused controversy in an interview with Scalfari was in 2013, at the very outset of his papacy, same year it began. In that interview, he made statements that immediately became infamous. Uh, three of them, according to Skojek. First off, the most serious of the evils that afflict the world these days are youth unemployment and the loneliness of the elderly. Remember that? That was famous. That was one of the first bad things you heard about Pope Francis. Also, a direct quote. Quote from Scalfari, quoting Francis. Everyone has his own idea of good and evil, and must choose to follow the good and fight evil as he conceives them. Relativism. That would be enough to make the world a better place. Relativism would be enough to make the world a better place. That's Pope Francis, according to Scalfari. I never know. Some Half the people call him Scalfari. The other half call him Scalfari. I should just pick one, but I tend to go back and forth. I'm sorry if that's functionally voiding. Third one, convert you, question mark, when Scalfari said, don't you want to convert me? Francis said, convert you? Proselytism is solemn nonsense. You have to meet people and listen to them. Now, we know that that piece of the equation is utterly consistent with Francis's message in his whole pontificate. As part and parcel of it, as he's been quoted directly saying that, he has quotes in Amoris Laetitia saying that, he has quotes in Laudato C insinuating that. That is the Francis message. And he's even said trying to convince others of the Christian faith, not even using the P word, is a mortal sin against ecumenism. So that part's valid. But yet ironically, it was this interview that indirectly gave birth to the idea of 1 Peter 5. Um, Steve goes on to say, I'm going to skip some of it, he tried to place uh, anti-Francis pieces on the strength of this and couldn't do it, so he, he, he realized he needed to launch his own project. He says, now, if you've watched these developments for the past six years, and this is 2019, so, so this is six years into the pontificate. This is four years ago. It has no doubt become clear to you that the Pope is using Scalfari to propagate his most extreme Ideas under a veneer of plausible deniability. Recall again what Father Lombardi, then papal spokesman, said in response to a controversy over that first 2013 interview. Listen to this. Pressed by reporters on the reliability of the direct quotations, Lombardi said during an October 2nd briefing that the text accurately captured the sense of what the Pope had said, and that if Francis felt his thought had been gravely misrepresented, he would have said so. Oh, but the Pope... So you had a situation where Lombardi, at time the spokespiece, was saying, yeah, he, he probably meant what Lombardi said because Francis did not object. And the Pope's explainers were out going, no, no, he didn't mean that. And it's like, Lombardi was like, this is my job, not yours. Sit down, bro. I'm telling you, he meant that. And you had Pope's planners going, no, he couldn't have meant that. And they're like, okay, stay in your lane. I'm the mouthpiece. I say he meant it. And I know I have access to him. Francis does not deny that he said this. There's the current denial in nascent form here, Skojic points out. It's not a verbatim transcript, but, and this is the part they no longer admit because they can't, a representation that accurately captures the sense of what the Pope had said. Now, with the more grave heresies uttered by Francis slash Scalfari, they can't just say, well, the representation accurately captures the sense of what he said. So they had to 
They had to, they couldn't accept that part because to say hell doesn't exist and Jesus was not God is the gravest thing possible. As for the promise correction, Steve Skojic writes, of any grave misrepresentation, it never came in this first interview. He said, basically, yeah. I mean, that's not exactly what he said, but it's the sense of it. That's all Lombardi said. No denial. And Pope Splainers were out there telling their audiences. I think it was on Catholic Answers too. Oh, there was a denial here. Mm, there might have been a, a, a recharacterization. No denial though. It never came. Not that time. Not any of the nine times. Now, Steve says nine because this is 2019. I believe that Scalfari, and I couldn't find these. I believe Scalfari did more boring, less striking interviews, one in 2020 and one in 2021. Or it might have been a late 2019 and one in a 2020. Um, and he died in 22. But I, I, I counted 11 interviews. Now, correct me out there if I'm wrong. What I remember are the last two, which add to these nine, were totally unsexy, nothing controversial. It could so happen to be that it's only nine, and it was the eighth and the ninth, the final two that were uncontroversial, and it might only be nine, but very difficult. Not any of the nine times by Skojek's count that interactions between Scalfari and Francis have made the news. Was there a grave misrepresentation correction by the Vatican mouthpiece? I don't have a mouthpiece. If I screw up here, a dad with a webcam, or any of the other dads with webcams out there, or even, you know, even Michael Voris, or even someone, John Henry Weston with LifeSite, that they, they have a little outfit behind them. They don't have a worldwide apparatus called the Catholic Church. Um, we have to trot out there and basically say something ourselves. Not the Pope, though. He has a mouthpiece whose job it is to be like, no, he didn't mean that. No hardcore denials. Here these are, and Skojic in this interview, invaluably, again, God bless Steve Skojic. Pray for the man to return to the faith. Did some really, really top-notch work for four or five years. He provides links to each of them. October 2013, six months into office. Around the time old McCarrick was giving his talk at Villanova saying, we, we cooked up this uh, Bregolio pontificate. Bregolio, uh, Francis, was there in Rome talking to Eugenio Scalfari. That was that first one with those three points. I'm not going to go through all of the controversies. The second interview was July 2014. Nine months later. The third one was October 2014, three months later. Listen to the frequency. Next one was March 2015, five months later. Next one was October 2015, six months later. The next one was November 2016, 13 months later. The next one after that was July 2017, eight months after that. Next one was March 2018, which is eight months later. The, the final one by 2019 was October the 8th, 2019. Uh, you know, seven months after the, the, the previous one. So he's going about half a year between Scalfari interviews. Giving interviews to a man that the Pope Splainers say is maligning him with each interview. At least seven of those involve grave words that would absolutely destroy the credibility of Pope Francis, right? I mean, let, stop, stop this show for a second. We can all agree that if, pope, if the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, actually said there's no hell, it would destroy his pontificate. Do we all agree there? I don't think any Pope splainer out there would disagree. Do we all agree... That if Pope Francis actually said <laughs> Jesus wasn't God, like a, an Apollinarian or a Nestorian or a, an Arian, 
Pope. He can't be Pope. He, he couldn't have done the job well. This is total disaster. See, they don't even want you remembering that this is kind of an open question. They don't want me doing this show right now. I don't know who the they is, but you have to understand. Because when we're starting to reason like this, just take out, take out, here's, here's a dry erase marker. Just set it on the shelf. Just look at it there. Can you see that? Oh, it's kind of there. Now, if this is, well, what if, what if, this is how I feel every time I go to the doctor. Well, if that's a navy blue, then you're fine. But if someone calls that royal blue, you're screwed. Your health is really messed up. That's how a lot of tests come out. If it's navy blue, you're whatever. I don't know, ovulating or something. Something worse than that. You have prostate cancer. If it's a royal blue, not. So you're sitting there. This is life in 2023. You're sitting there. You take a test and you're like, I'm sitting here looking at what shade of blue this is. I'm completely screwed in option B, contingency B. I'm totally fine contingency A. And a lot of times the difference is like the, the hues of blue or something. You realize how fragile it all it is. How frangible, that's the better word. How frangible our whole arrangement of comfort and expectations for signifiers in society to mean what we say they mean really is. You know, so the Pope's planners don't even want me doing this show where I'm like, look, oh, I'm going to I'm going to read to you um, what Scalfari said. The Pope said he's a, a journalist, a very respected journalist in Europe, by the way. I would push the La Repubblica free zines out of my face when they hand it to me on La Linea A going to the Greg in Rome. But all the, the Italians would would hungrily read, grab them and read them. He's a very respected journalist, not considered a tabloidist. Okay? They don't even want me reading that and then reading to you what the Vatican said, because the Vatican, fact of the matter is, didn't say much. So that's why I'm telling you right now, they don't want us sitting there looking at the test and going, navy blue or royal blue, because that's uncomfortable, because it's frangible. If it turns out one way, then... There's a real problem with Francis. So let's just say that there are other bad things he said to Scalfari that would be quite devastating. None as bad as these two. Right? There's no hell. And Jesus was not God while he lived. Wow. Yikes. As my friend Steve Rummelsberg says. They don't even want us. You, I'm, I'm reminding you. They don't want me reminding you that this is even something that Catholics had, have had to confront in the last eight or 10 years. Skojic goes on. If the Pope had an objection to the way Scalfari represents him, wouldn't you think he would have said something by now? That's how I try to read italics. Wouldn't you think he would have said something by now? Common sense. I, I would ask because Scalfari wasn't dead yet. He died three years after this article was written by Skojic. If the Pope had an objection to the way Scalfari represents him, would he have essentially eulogized his friend by saying, I loved our conversations? They were deep, man. No. You would have been pissed. You tried to ruin my job. I'm never speaking to you again, much less speaking to you for an interview on the record. And I'm not going to say I love those conversations where you maligned me. That's what any sane person would say. And Skojic is great. I'll continue reading. Now, it's impossible to say how many actual conversations the two men have had. In 2016, after five published interactions with the Pope, Scalfari said this, I am honored to receive frequent phone calls from Pope Francis. We've not met in person for over a year, so I was very pleased to receive his invitation. So the key piece of information there, thank you very much, Steve Skojic. You made doing this show very easy. The last two shows I did required a lot of info gathering and compressing to make it intelligible for you guys. The two I did with, with Rummelsberg. This is a very easy show to do because of Steve Skojek. So he might call me names or whatever because he doesn't like the patriarchy. But I like Steve. He might not like me, but I like him. He can't stop that. He just did too much good work. I'm just one of these guys. If I like you, I like you. Even if you say, you know, Tim, Tim's a cotton-headed ninny-muggins, I just like you. 
I'm not, I don't have thin skin. That's the thing. Okay. Pope Francis contacted him for another interview, for interview number six, bro. He'd done five of these things by 2016. Each one, each one of the first five was super controversial. And the Vatican was doing these, what Steve calls pseudo-denials. Steve Skojic calls them pseudo-denials. Good term. And Pope Francis is ringing him up. You know, here, this is my phone. Hey, let's get another interview going. This is a guy that's maligned you five, five times? No. One journo lies to you or about you. And you say, I'm never talking to that dude again. Particularly Francis is very sensitive. Very thin-skinned. Famously thin-skinned. Say all of his friends from Buenos Aires. He is not a magnanimous guy that's like, oh, that's fine. It's a program. They had a deal worked out. I'll say this. You say I said this. I'll come out. I'll play. Uh, I have this prearranged, vague pseudo denial and let everyone bat it around. And then we're doing predictive programming. Then we're getting everyone used to having a pope that might be, but you're not allowed to say is really a heretic. Probably is, but you can't say he really is a heretic. That's the Francis pontificate. We all know he probably is. Forget all the specifics for a second. We all know what's going on in our heart of hearts. But, but you're not allowed to say it. Unless you're like in these cam the gay camps. You know? Are you SSPX? Are you a Benny Plenist? Are you SSPV? Are you CMRI? Are you, I'm not any of those things, man. I'm just a Catholic guy that I'm, I'm harder to hoodwink than a lot of you guys. That's all. And I'm, I'm not saying that to be cocky. I'm not saying it to whatever. I'm just, I remember stuff. Steph, Steph's always like, you remember month and date on all these things. A lot of these shows up here, I don't even have the whiteboards. I remember months and dates like no one you have ever known. So all of this stuff with the dubia, September 2016, the Buenos Aires, you know, you know, he stuck that in, uh, you know, he stuck the letter from the Buenos Aires bishops in, in fall of, of 2016 after more Letizia came out. And then the dubia cardinals waited this amount of days. I had all that stuff on lock. And I have, seven years later, I have it on lock. So I don't forget. I remember... Hardcore. I remember where I was sitting in my classroom when I was, when I was, my students were taking a theology test and I was reading Scalfari's words about Francis saying Jesus was not God. And the funny thing was, I just taught the Arianism and monophysitism unit. I was like, oh, he's an Arian or monophysite. And then I read the pseudo denial. I was like, that is no denial. I remember the lighting in the room. I was going to show a movie after we were done. We were watching Lord of the Rings after they, the last test taker was done. And I was like, nope. I remember that was after both synods had closed. Skojic goes on, the Vatican has never even attempted to deny that the two meet or converse over the phone. Like regularly. In fact, the Vatican has officially published some of their conversations. This is what the Pope's planners will lie to you about. That there's never been any Vatican reconciliation. And this... Um, this I don't remember until I read this this morning. The Vatican has officially published some of their conversations. Skojic wrote this in 2018. He's citing himself. Of course, at least one of the interviews, the first one that got the ball rolling, did appear on the Vatican website before it was taken down in late 2013. Then briefly it reappeared in 2014, then disappeared again. That is the Francis... Perron program like no other. The same interview also appeared along with other Scalfari interviews in an Italian-only book called Interviews and Conversations with Journalists, published by the Vatican's official publishing arm, the Libreria Editrice Vaticana. As Italian journalist and author Antonio Sochi wrote in 2015, he's one of my favorites, the interviews of Pope Bergoglio in Scalfari have never been denied. He continues, Indeed, they have been republished in full in Absorbatory Romano. 
the official publication of the Vatican. And they have been just completely re republished by the same Argentine Pope in a book signed by him from the Libraria Editrice Vaticana. So they are, in effect, official. I'm going to sit here and look at you as you hear that for the first time, unless you're an avid 1 Peter 5 reader, the way I was for, for half a decade. And I even missed this one. They are, in effect, official. Doesn't mean they're magisterial or anything like that. They are officially recognized Vatican interviews. The Observatore Romano and a teaching arm, uh, a publication arm of the Vatican Libraria at Atrice Vaticana in two places. Let it sink in. These interviews are official, my friends. It's not what you've been told. It's a red pill moment right now because of, because of how bad the stuff he said was. You could take the red pill, wake up and see you're just a battery. You're a human battery being harvested by these hideous aliens with the shit landscape. Remember in, in the Vatican, uh, in, in the Matrix? Horrible landscape. The world doesn't look like what you think. You've been plugged in as a battery to a matrix that makes you think your life is beautiful and norm normal in a good way. Now you have a chance. Take the red pill. Stay out of the matrix and, and live in this shit landscape. Play the ball as it lies. Truth. Are you a philosopher? Or consequences? Take the blue pill. No truth. Your consequentialism. Remember that game, Truth or Consequences? I thought that was really appropriate. Red pill, blue pill. Truth or Consequences. Take the blue pill, you'll be like that guy Cypher. It's in the Matrix eating a delicious prime rib. And he's like, I don't need the truth. I've got fake prime rib. I'll just go back into the Matrix world where everything's beautiful and happy. I'm offering you that opportunity right now. And, and Skojic did this a lot. He brings the receipts. So let it be said when they speak Gordon, Tim Gordon, Tim Gordon, let them speak Skojic as well because he brought the receipts in the first half of this pontificate. I don't care if he doesn't like my patriarchy stuff. I like these early articles and there are bevies of them among the other controversies that have arisen from their interaction scalfari reported on four separate occasions once in 2018 twice in 17 once in 2015 that francis held a bizarre eschatology in which there was no hell and the souls of the unrighteous would be annihilated another condemned heresy four different times how many were corrected do you think I'm staring at my screen like I'm talking to a person rhetorically. I'm looking at my, my Canon EOS or whatever the hell it's called. Zero were corrected. Four times he said annihilationism is the name of the heresy. Zero corrections. It's a clown world. If you were hanging on to hopes that Pope Francis is a good guy, or at least a neutral guy, neutral pope, take the red pill. It, it's ugly. It's uglier than, you know, he's kind of a sympathetic guy. Remember when they all lied? When he said, um, remember when they lied? Who was it? What outfit was it? It was one that didn't often lie about Francis. Don't quote me, but it might have been National Catholic Register. Not the crazy NCR, the good NCR. Remember when the Marxist gave him Jesus on the, on the hammer and sickle cross? The communists gave him that? They made up what, I'm not sure it was NCR. I think it was though. It was one of the good ones. They like made up what he said. They said he was like, oh no, this is bad. And really what he said was like, I like this very much. Something like this. Go look it up yourself. But they flat out lied. Take the red pill. It's bad. He's not a good guy. Well, how can you have a Pope that doesn't believe Jesus was God? 
I know, my man, but that's where we're at. We have a pope that doesn't believe Jesus was God while he was alive. He told us in 2015, months before Amoris Laetitia was published, that Francis had confided in him, this is um, Scalfari, that he'd confided in him his thoughts about the outcome of the synod that would lead to the exhortation Amoris Laetitia. Here's what Scalfari told him about the synod process, which would eventuate with Amoris Laetitia nine months later. The diverse opinion of the bishops is part of this modernity of the church and of the diverse societies in which she operated. But the goal is the same. And for that which regards the admission of the divorce to the sacraments, it confirms that this principle has been accepted by the synod. This is bottom line result. The de facto appraisals are entrusted to their confessors. But at the end of faster or slower paths, all the divorced who will who ask will be readmitted to communion. That translation comes from Rorate Chely. He means all the divorced and remarried, the, the adulterers. And Scalfari said that in 2015, and look, he ended up being right. Scalfari was right a lot, wasn't he? Scalfari was right a lot. Obviously, Scalfari wasn't misrepresenting anything on that topic. Skojic Knights notes. And that's returned now to the present controversy. If you're still doubtful, let me ask you a question. This is kind of like my thought experiment. If someone you have treated as a friend, who's been a respectful journalist for 65 years, one of the most respected journalists in all of Europe, and who runs a major publication in your country, told, you that the, world, told the world that you, a Catholic, believed Jesus wasn't truly God, even if you weren't the Pope, even if you were just Joe Schmo, how many people would it take to hold you down and keep you from personally refuting every word and making a declaration of your faith? How long would it be before you found a microphone to declare your fidelity to Christ and to condemn the vicious calumny you had been subjected to? And yet for some reason, Francis hasn't even preached a homily in his daily masses for the past two days. The exact time frame in which this entire contro controversy, controversy has been most heated. He chose to celebrate Mass in the Casa Santa Marta on Thursday without pronouncing the homily. He sat and listened to another priest do it. That would be the perfect place in his homily to disabuse anyone who thought that he said Jesus was not God. This is So I guess Skojek wrote this about two days after this controversy erupted. So why should we believe Scalfari? Skojic asks, and I think he answers it really compellingly. Because I do believe Scalfari. This isn't one of those videos. I never do them. One of these videos where it's like a coaxing prompt, a prompting coax. Cheeky. Is the Pope an alien? In the first like five minutes, it's like, well, no, but watch this other stuff. Watch me sling my... Like Gugon, wall grease, or whatever. That like like a lot of these Catholic guys. No, I'll say, I usually the answer is usually yes if I do a a prompt question. Why should we believe Scalfari? Which I do. Because Scalfari has everything to lose, writes Skojek, pitting his reputation against the Roman Pontiff, and nothing to gain. The Pope, even this Pope. Even though he's Francis, he has almost no moral high ground. He has moral high ground and a global audience. People, he has more moral high ground now in 23 than he did in 19. In 19, people were sick of him. They all got selective amnesia with Pope Francis. A lot of Pope Splainers out there, more than in 2019. Pope Francis could destroy Scalfari with a word. And the latter, whose death cannot be far in the future... Scalfari, would go to his grave under a cloud of scandal and ignominy, his hard-earned reputation in tatters, his legacy, the only thing an atheist like Scalfari can really believe he will leave behind when he's gone, lost, due to his own careless, casual, repetitive, repetitive fabrications. What would be worth that? Nothing. Why we should believe Scalfari is the wrong question. The question is, why should we believe Francis, 
who has made no effort, not even once, to distance himself from these remarks, to clarify his positions, or to cease his interactions with Scalfari himself. At the time Steve wrote this, it was three years before Scalfari's death, which would be, for all intents and purposes, eulogized three years later by Francis saying, I really loved our conversations. He's thumbing his nose at you again. Here's a a, a Vatican non-denial. He says, the second Vatican non-denial, don't be fooled. Looking again at the most recent Scalfari claims, the Vatican, as we predicted they would in our analysis of his editorial, hyperlink there, issued a pseudo-denial of the allegation that the Pope had denied the divinity of Jesus. You're about to hear it. This has become standard operating procedure when dealing with Scalfari claims as we have demonstrated in the past. I'm going to read the pseudo-denial. This is kind of the heart of the matter. Very slowly. As already stated on other occasions, says Matteo Bruni, director of the Holy See Press Office, October the 9th, the words that Dr. Eugenio Scalfari attributes in quotation marks to the Holy Father during talks with him cannot be considered a faithful account of what was actually said, but represent a personal and free interpretation of what he heard. Uh Uh-oh. As appears completely evident from what is written today regarding the divinity of Jesus Christ. One more time, not as slow for effect. As already stated on other occasions, the words that Dr. Eugenio Scalfari attributes in quotation marks to the Holy Father during talks with him cannot be considered a faithful account of what was actually said, but represent a personal and free interpretation of what he heard. As appears completely evident from what is written today regarding the divinity of Jesus Christ. Three big points. Number one, he has to say, as already stated on other occasions. Do you know what this means? Unless you've studied metaphysics, you don't know what I'm going to say. If Matteo Bruni is admitting here in a prefatory clause that what he's stating about the quiddity of this species applies to the genus other occasions, then he's, he's already typifying for you. Look, I'm going to tell you something I've told you before. I'm the, the mouthpiece. And I'm going to tell you something that this has happened before. You might think, well, well yeah, he's, he's mischaracterized the Pope before, Scalfari. No, because each statement is unique. So he's saying, I'm going to tell you something that is typical of a pattern of Scalfari quoting Pope Francis to you as a journalist. That's point number one. Now, point number two is the words, cut cut out the prepositional phrases. This is how you get to the heart of a sentence. Cut out the prep phrases. The words, bunch of prep phrases cannot be considered a faithful account of what was actually said. That's This is point number two. Faithful account means, in context here, it's not a good rendering of Pope Francis's exact words. There were different words Pope Francis spoke than what Scalfari said. Okay, fine. Still no denial, right? He could just be saying, this is a paraphrasing... And this would, number two, would also relate to my first point above about, as already stated on other occasions, he's just saying, all he's saying is something very uninteresting that everyone already knew about Scalfari. If you, if you link up one and two, as on other occasions, Scalfari is paraphrasing. That's all he said to this point. Now let me go on to the big one. But instead, in hard brackets, They can't be considered a faithful account of what was actually said, but instead represent a personal and free interpretation of what he 
heard. That's the third point. He's admitting he heard something akin to his interpretation of what he heard. You would never say this about someone, hey, are you gonna go to the you gonna go to the Pels game tonight? If my wife asked me that, because I go to a lot of Pels games. No. I don't want to see him play the, you know, the Hornets. I have no interest in seeing that team. Steph would never come back and be like, oh, I thought you were going because you wanted to see that team. That's a total inversion, right? That's what it needs to be for Pope Francis to be like a good guy or probably even Pope. It has to be total inversion, right? But Steph, Steph would never say the exact opposite of what I said and then go, oh, if I were denying it, I would not use these words of Matteo Bruni. I would not say, well, that was what, that represents a personal and free interpretation of what Steph heard. No, 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 I wouldn't say that. I might say my wife's characterization of my words to, to people that weren't there for the conversation, who didn't have privity to it, um, were a personal and free interpretation of what she heard. If I said, yeah, I like, I like spaghetti okay, um, and then she said, yeah, I, I, I like spaghetti pretty well. I'm like, those aren't my exact words. And by okay, I usually kind of mean it, it politely. I don't like it so much. But yeah, that's a, that's a free and personal interpretation of what my wife might have heard me say. Most of the message is correct. Most of the paraphrasing is correct. Skojic agrees with what I just said. He goes on to say about this non-denial denial, this pseudo-denial. He says, in other words... Francis didn't say exactly the words Scalfari quoted him as saying. That's all those three sentences stand for, propositionally. Francis didn't say exactly the words Scalfari quoted him as saying. We already know their paraphrase interviews. That's an accepted form of inter interview in old Europe. And everyone knows, Francis knows it. He granted double digits of interviews to Scalfari. He didn't mind it. Not Pope Francis categorically denies that he ever questioned the divinity of Jesus in Scalfari's hearing, and he wishes to affirm again at this juncture that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, made incarnate for the salvation of our sins. That's what Skojic saying he, he should have said. And he was during his life as well. He needed to add that. And after the first pseudo-denial did not quell the outrage because people were actually saying what I'm saying and what Skojic's saying. They're characterizing the pseudo-denial kind of close to what the way we characterize him. Pseudo-denial. The matter was addressed again the next day. For Skojic, this was yesterday. Um, this time by Paolo Ruffini, Prefect of the Secretariat for Communication. It sounds a bit better, okay? This is the day after... Everyone agreed the first take, which is the most accurate to what they're trying to do. First take was not even a denial. I remember this. Everyone was like, you didn't even deny it, dude. He, your Pope just said Jesus isn't God, at least while he was the word made flesh. And you didn't even deny it. So they had to come out and do another one. What does that tell you? The second one sounds better. I, together with the Rhetorical forces of Steve Skojic on the page will team up, super team, to show you why this isn't much better. Here's how it wrote. The Holy Father never said what Scalfari wrote. Vatican's communication head Paolo Ruffini said at an October 10 press conference, adding that both the quoted remarks and the free reconstruction interpretation by Dr. Scalfari of the conversations which go back more than two years ago, cannot be considered a faithful account of what was said by the Pope. That, that will be found, rather, throughout the Church's magisterium and, the, and Pope Francis's own on Jesus. True God and true man, Ruffini added. This is, there's basically three elements in the first pseudo-denial and three elements in the second pseudo-denial. And obstinately, obdurately, Francis is not even letting his communications people, I think behind the scenes, 
do much of a, a denial. He's like, no, rephrase each of the three elements of the first pseudo denial. Rephrase them slightly more compellingly. They're the exact same three things repackaged. You have to look at them side by side. I was doing this. It's remarkable. Those three elements are um, the Holy Father never said what Scalfari wrote. That's that first thing. That it's, it's basically not a word for word quote. Right, it's paraphrasing. That's the first thing. Said October 9th, then again on October 10th. But the quoted remarks in the free construction interpretation repeats that expression by Dr. Scalfrey, which go back more than two years ago, cannot be considered faithful account. So he's just saying it's a paraphrasing and it's not a perfectly faithful account paraphrasing either. And the third element is that faithful account will be found rather throughout the church's magisterium and France's own on Jesus, true God and true man. So he said, we'll check his, his, his new magisterium. Francis hasn't published much on that. I know he's true God and true man, but guess who else thought he was true God and true man? A lot of the Arians, a lot of the Monophysites, a lot of the Nestorians. There was a question about what he was when he was alive. So Francis um, could have said, yeah, he's, he's God right now. The denial, according to Scalfari, was while he lived 33 years in Nazareth. What was he? He was more like true man then. It's Arianism. Now and before that, before the incarnation and after it, true God. Ain't that crazy? Ain't that crazy? Three exact things. On first glance, Skojic writes, this happened, this appeared to represent progress. I even bought it for a minute. It looks almost like an actual denial. See, I, I saw it right away. I, I didn't almost buy it. It's a little better. It isn't though. It's just a clever repackaging of the earlier denial. The Holy Father never said what Scalfari wrote. It's simply a more forceful way of dissembling. That means lying. It still means... He didn't say exactly the words Scalfari quoted him as saying. Yeah, it doesn't mean anything more than that, Skojic says. And it's absolutely not a refutation of the substance of the claim, which is absolutely, propositionally undeniable. There is no refutation of the claim there. We already know Francis uses weaponized ambiguity. Today, people were, Pope's planners were spiking the football that that Francis had said the German synodal way went, has, is perhaps going too far. They were spiking the football. You know when else Francis said that about the German synodal way? January of this year. You know what he did the same within 10 days of condemning the German synodal way? With no punishment, by the way. You know what he did within 10 days? He tried to elevate their leader, the German synodal way, to the doctrinal chief. So that is weaponized ambiguity. That is Peronism. You need to look into it. If you don't know about Juan Peron and his distinct kind of say yes but mean no, no but mean yes, Machiavellianism, look into it or you won't understand Pope Francis. Look into it or you won't understand why did Pope Francis charge Cardinal Casper in summer of 2015 before the second family synod of going out, going on to Raymond Arroyo's show with all those American conservatives and say that you've fallen out of favor and that I'm not going to elect for the Casper proposal in Amor Satizia, which he did. Because the Kabuki theater works, it confuses the nitwits and even the midwits. No refutation of the substance of the claim. Talking about the free construction, reconstruction, sorry, an interpretation by Dr. Scalfari, is merely a wordy description of Scalfari's interview style without notes or recordings. That's all it is. It's a wordy description of Scalfari's interview style without notes or recording. That's all it is. Either of those October the 9th, October the 10th repudiations or pseudo repudiations, all they're doing is in sort of vague language saying, Scalfari doesn't take notes or record his interviews, and therefore, 
This is a paraphrasing of what he heard. And it's not and it's not perfect. Why does he do this though, Tim? Normie's always asked that. Why why does the CIA do predictive programming? Why does the CIA do predictive programming? Why did Clinton poll test everything in his presidency? To poll test, to predict programming, to condition you, to condition you to returning to Pope Splaining even after the McCarrick scandal, the, the, fall, the summer and fall of shame. That is, it should be noted, in interview style, Francis clearly favors, because he did 10, 11 interviews with the guy, when floating his trial balloons, because it can be called into question when the heat is on. I didn't say that. Perfect format for a Peronist Pope who wants to I'm quoting Heiner Wilmer now, who said this before Francis elevated him for doctrinal chief, turn the church upside down with the synodal way. They're doing it now, Skojic said. It's also not conclusive to cite things Francis has said in the past about Jesus as a refutation of what he may have said to Scafari. Never forget the Perone rule. Self-contradiction is part of the game. Thank you, Steve Skojic. The Perone rule means you contradict yourself, like what I've shown multiple times about Cardinal Casper. He is in favor. He isn't in favor. I'm never going to do communion for divorce and civilly rear. Never. And then he does it. Now, Skojic writes, no answers forthcoming. And I believe he was right on this. This is almost certainly the last we'll hear from the Vatican on this matter. I I, I looked around some and I didn't find any more. And I don't remember any more. They say a couple brief things and that's it. Francis won't address it. Vigano has challenged the Pope to make a personal statement on the matter, Skojic writes, but we all know that the Pope's response to anything Vigano says is obdurate silence. It's possible one or two other bishops or cardinals, the usual suspects like Burke or Schneider, will echo the challenge, but that'll be the end of it, and you're not allowed to bring it up, which is why I'm bringing it up today. After the Strickland demotion, Francis has jumped the shark. Yeah, he's jumped the shark lots before, but I say bring out Heiner Wilmer. Don't forget what happened early 2023 and bring out Scalfari. We call that the dead hand controlling. Let the dead hand of Scalfari control the fate of Francis. Never forget the reality of the Scalfari Francis connection. There is no denial. There's no bona fide denial here. If someone says, oh, there's a denial, ask him to go through every clause the way I did and Skojek did. It is probably useless, Skojek writes, to speculate whether Francis truly believes that Jesus is God. He is not known for his Eucharistic reverence. Remember, he, he elevated Heiner Velmer who said, as number two, who said that the Eucharist is overrated. He certainly does not act like Christ's teachings are divine and immutable. Even so, the Scalfari claims won't establish him in any formal way as an apostate. He, he, he went on. Pope Splainer's Pope Splain. The suggestion that he may be well be added to the ever-growing pile of Bergoglian scandals, and this suggestion, based on everything else he's doing, will nevertheless be considered unthinkable by many. Those who find it plausible will be dismissed as conspiracy theorists and lunatics. Luckily, that's kind of gone away. More confusion. Of course, if a recent report by Church Militant is to be believed, Francis has said he wants confusion. A confusion that will, according to the report, upend the established order, which will promote a type of conflict, and from that conflict, a new reality will be ushered in. Wasn't that always the point of his call to Hagan Leo? Make a mess. Remember he said to make a mess, that means confuse people, so that you can do whatever you want. Like the CIA said its goal was. If Americans can't tell the difference between fact and fiction, you can rule from on top. I have long believed, writes Skojek, just three more paragraphs, that Francis uses Scalfari as a primary means to launder his most extreme ideas. This is called predictive programming, but Skojek probably thinks that's a conspiracy theory. Allowing them to take root in the Catholic consciousness while keeping him free of any proven guilt. Scalfari benefits because the church is no friend to his ideology. Even the Wikipedia entry on the publication states that La Repubblica used to be known for its critical stand vis-a-vis the Catholic Church. 
but this position has drastically changed after the onset of the papacy of Francis. It's a naturally symbiotic relationship between two men who appear all too comfortable with anti-Catholic ideals and a vision for a world free of traditional mores and the teaching of the church. Only the most naive among us think the ongoing collaboration of these two is an accident. Excellent piece of, whatever you call this, mixture of journalism, commentary, investigative reporting, a little bit, a, t- a smattering of, a smattering of philosophy and historical theology. It's a really well written piece, and I, I miss Skojek being Catholic, man. The evidence suggests this. This is the title. Everyone, go read it for yourselves. The evidence suggests the Scalfari Francis connection is no accident. October the eleventh, twenty nineteen, one Peter five. It was a great, great weblog. Don't let the Pope splainers forget. Never forget. This thing is not yet been repudiated. It never will be. You could say, no, there are two pseudo denials of it, but all they did in three kind of moves, you know, I'm good with these rhetorical moves. I have that thing called the scholar's mate, disprove Protestantism forever in four questions. Yes, no, involving canonicity. They have three moves here. They repeated them. All those three moves do demonstrate is that Scalfari is a paraphrasing journalist, which was an acceptable form of journalism back in the day. I don't need to say much on what if Pope Francis doesn't believe Jesus was God while he was alive. You get it. Look at that, look at that blue marker. Is it royal? Is it navy? I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly, but I know this. The bigger threat to answering royal or navy one or the other in particular, is the idea, the Pope Splainers hate it, the power structures of the world, the WEF hates it, that we can sit there and with clarity look at it, I'm going to go get my whatever microscope or a magnifying glass and really examine it. We have all of Francis's words, baby. Look at them. Go back to the past. Go search 1 Peter 5. LifeSite News has some of the more recent stuff, but we can look at it. It's nerve-wracking for them. If you just say, look, I'm not saying that Francis definitely said what Scalfari said he said, or Steve Skojic said he said, or Tim Gordon said he said, but I'm going to get out my magnifying glass and look for myself. I don't need Catholic answers or Michael Lofton to shame me for saying, it looks like the emperor's butt naked. Uh, Now, I'm willing to go get my bifocals to see his, whatever, nudity hanging down. But uh, it looks to me like that's a nude man, nude monarch. And I'm going to have a look for myself. I don't need to be shamed. I will not abide being shamed by anyone in the name of charity or righteousness or faithfulness it's a bunch of malarkey i have a magnifying glass and i have access to assessing whether that color is navy or royal blue and i'm going to do it for myself that's terrifying for them because they know that it's going to come out in an unfavorable way for them and pope francis don't fly off the bark like michael voris said god bless him god bless all the names i mentioned god bless skojek god bless lofton god bless catholic answers We all have difficulties, some small, some medium, some large, different times, but one we all share is named Jorge Mario Bergoglio, a.k.a. Pope Francis, sitting there in Rome. Never forget. Never forget. He did not repudiate another's characterizations of his word words that Jesus was not God while he was man.